Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this event at the LSE Middle East Centre on Islam and ethnicity in the Kurdish political sphere in Turkey. We're very pleased to welcome our relatively recently joined LSE colleague, Mehmet Kurt, who joined the school in October. He is a Marie Sklodowska Curie Global Fellow at LSE and at Yale University. His research lies at the intersection of political science, sociology, and political ethnography, with a specific focus on political Islam and civil society in Kurdish Turkey and among the Turkish diaspora in Egypt and the US. Mehmet received his PhD from Selçuk University. Um, he has also been a British Academy Newton Advanced Fellow at Queen Mary University of London. And he recently took part in a dialogue about radicalization and extremism as part of an EU Horizon 2020 project at the University of Manchester before he joined LSE. Mehmet has published a monograph based on his PhD, which is entitled Kurdish Hezbollah in Turkey, Islamism, Violence and the State, published by Pluto in 2017. And he's published more widely in both English and Turkish on religion, on civil society, human rights and politics across Turkey and the Middle East. Mehmet, welcome. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for the introduction, and thank you for hosting me as a part of the Kurdish Studies uh, series. It's very exciting indeed, and it's a great honor to speak after David McDowell uh, as a part of the series as well. Uh, this evening, I will uh, present a glimpse into my uh, most recent research, including my PhD and my postdoctoral research on Islamic civil society organizations across Turkey, Syria, and border. Um, so in general, basically, I work on political Islam in the Kurdish context, and I worked on, on Kurdish Hezbollah and uh, published a monograph, about, a monograph about them. But today I will be basically speaking on some aspects uh, in comparison with the Kurdish national movement's transformation or reconfiguration of Islam in the Kurdish political scene. Um, to begin with, I think we need to talk about the rise of political Islam across the Middle East. And uh, obviously, we can expand this talk for hours to talk about the national, regional, and international aspects of this rise. But to provide just brief introduction, uh, I would like to say that on the national level, basically in the last, last 20 years, we see a transformation uh, of Turkish state from Kemalist nationalist to an Islamist nationalist uh, in terms of the state administration and the power blocks that are uh, ruling the country. On the regional level, um, we see the Arab uprisings turning into, into a catastrophic uh, period of violence and conflict. We see the Syrian war is resulting in six million refugees, uh, half of them living across Turkey, and obviously in connection in Connected to these developments, we see the rise of Islamist and uh, Salafi extremism uh, in different forms, implemented, support or, or supported, or manipulated by different actors, including the states and non-state actors on the field. And obviously, in the international level, we can talk about the rise of populism and authoritarianism that also creates a huge issues and, 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 and problems uh, in this specific context. Uh, so all these developments basically are essential to see, to, be, to analyze the, the, the situation of political Islam in the Kurdish politics in an internet, intersectional uh, analytical perspective. Uh, but let me go into more specific uh, details and basically provide more, like, provide more examples from what I will be talking about. So the first part of my talk will be focusing on the situation of Islam in the Kurdish national movement. And by Kurdish national movement, I do mean the Kurdistan Workers' Party, uh, the, the, the legal political parties affiliated, or not affiliated, but somehow connected uh, to uh, this uh, national movement, like HDP or Democratic Region Party, and also the legal and 
civil organizations operating in Turkey. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, we need to consider the developments in northern Syria as a part of this movement as well. So. Um, uh, I, I, I see that most of you are already aware of what the PKK is and their developments and so on and so on. So there is no need really to talk about the details of what the PKK was and what transformation it has gone through. But just to provide some highlights, I need to tell that in 19, 1980s, the PKK uh, was a secularist Marxist organization, and their position towards religion was quite strict. Um, this alienated some conservative uh, practicing Muslims in the Kurdish region. In the 1980s, as I said, the Kurdish political movement, the Kurdish national movement, uh, was not um, a mainstream movement yet, but uh, fastly increasing in it, it, its influence among the Kurdish masses. And uh, soon, basically, they had to face their strict and, uh, to some extent, anti-religion uh, positionalities through the practicing Muslims and the supporting base of the PKK. So in the 1990s, we need to talk about the return of the religion in the Kurdish uh, political sphere, where we can see, for example, um, Kurdish imams, melas and sedas, uh, giving preaching in the Met TV, the, in the Kurdish TVs uh, broadcasting from Europe, or uh, preaching, practicing, uh, praying guerrillas on, on, on the Kurdish TV as well. So this also should be considered uh, uh, basically as a counter strategy towards the state propaganda that the PKK is uh, strictly anti-religion and wants to eradicate uh, Islam among Kurdish society. Uh, so we see a lot of discursive strategies shaping the political field in the 1990s, not only in the battleground, but also, as I said, on media and, and, and in the, in the uh, publications and so on and so on. <laughs> In the 1990s, we uh, see that the ruling cadre of the Kurdish national movement uh, is still uh, strictly Marxist and secularist, and uh, they uh, are not happy with the religious elites in, in Kurdistan. And obviously there are some reasons and dynamics behind this that I can expand in, in, in the question uh, after my talk. Um, in the 2000s, however, we see a paradigm change in the Kurdish uh, national movement. Um, so for the first time, I mean, this is also the period where the Justice and Development Party, the Islamist Justice and Development Party came into power in 2003. Abdullah Hojalan was captured in Kenya in 1999, and there was a period of silence um, among the PKK fighters in the, in the mountains. So, and uh, soon after, in the mid 2000s, basically, we see um, a gradually developing a paradigm change in the PKK discourse, uh, more prominently in the discourse and writing of Abdullah Hojalan, the founder of the PKK, but also expanding towards the social and political base of the Kurdish politics, both in legal and uh, illegal um, spheres. So, for the first time, for example, we see um, trade unions. Uh, and also civil society organizations that is clearly in support of the Kurdish cause or basically articulating the Kurdish question through uh, religious discourse. And uh, for example, revolutionary imams, it is, uh, I mean, it is, they, they call themselves revolutionary imams, but their official name is Dianet and Wakufe Mekçileri Sendikası. And also uh, an association of imams, Dianet, there uh, have been established in early 2000s. And obviously, this is the period when um, the Kurdish national movement gained a lot of municipalities um, uh, uh, and uh, established uh, many festivals, cultural festivals. And they basically created an opening towards the traditional and historical figures and values of Kurdish society. Um, 
Within this frame, uh, they also welcomed uh, Kurdish madrasas and Kurdish seydas, the Kurdish imams, uh, as basically the protector of the Kurdish language and also as a base of resistance through several historical figures like Sheikh Said and uh, Sheikh Ubaidullah Nahri and Sheikh Mahmoud Ebarzanji and several others. Um, and obviously there is an accumulation of civil resistance through these religious uh, organizations and networks among the, the, uh, the supporting base of the Kurdish national movement, which resulted in the Civil Friday prayers in 2011 and continued for two years that I will be talking about in details in, in a minute. And uh, lately, through the peace negotiation between the PKK and the Turkish states, basically we see also the establishment of the Democratic Islam, Cong Islam Congress in 2014 and the Second Democratic Islam Congress in 2016, where uh, more than 300 delegations attended these uh, meetings. Uh, and these people are um, sheikhs, seydas, um, religious figures from Kurdish society, politicians and civil society figures who are uh, representatives or members of different religious groups in the Kurdish society, including Alevis and, and Sunnis and, and, and different other groups. Uh, I, will also talk in, I will be talking about this uh, briefly. Um, so the Civil Friday prayers basically was one of the most effective uh, civil disobedience uh, protests that took place in, in early 2000 and uh, in the spring of 2011 and that continued till 2000 to, uh, to mid 2013. Um, during this time Across the Kurdish region, in many uh, city centers and towns, we see that people attended uh, to the Civil Friday prayers where not state-appointed imams, but the Kurdish melas and seydas who led the Friday prayers, Friday sermons, uh, the khutbah, uh, the preaching was, uh, was mainly in Kurdish, and the focus of uh, these uh, prayers were basically uh, talking about the, the focus of these this, uh, prayers were basically the Kurdish uh, language and collective rights. Uh, finding a legitimate uh, points in Quran, in Hadith, in the life of Muhammad and later in the Medina constitution. Um, and obviously these people uh, have expressed that they are against the monopoly of the uh, presidency of religious affairs, Dianet, who, uh, who runs the state mosques across Turkey and basically regulate and standardize uh, the, the context of the religious prayers like uh, the Friday sermons and so on and so on. And obviously uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, religious prayers are only available in Turkish and, all, and, and the prayer part also Arabic. Uh, but the usage of the Kurdish was prevented from the mosque. So this was also another point where these people protested and said that if uh, uh, you want to be basically providing a service in Kurdish, we are not happy to attend your mosques. Um, so we see here uh, a picture from, uh, from uh, Civil Friday prayers where the banner says that uh, those who, who reject uh, our language cannot teach us our religion. And uh, here, basically, we can talk about a formation, a formation of, um, of a theology of liberation that basically in the 1950s and 60s, 60s became an essential political mobilizer ac ac across Latin America. And this was a synthesis of Christian theology and Marxist socioeconomic al analysis. So uh, obviously, in the Kurdish politics, no one talked about the, the, the theo theology of liberation. But when we look at the context and the practices and how these people organized uh, through, um, through Friday sermons and public events and how they use the prayers as a form of resistance, uh, we can basically say that there is many similarities between the two movements. Uh, and uh, civil Friday prayers 
Civil Fr Friday prayers um, ended after two years when, uh, during the peace process, when Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish president, uh, appointed a special representative, the Mufti of Diyarbakir, uh, to negotiate this issue with people. And uh, eventually he convinced people uh, uh, to end the Civil Friday prayers. And there was a de facto agreement that the Kurdish now can be used in the mosques where the majority of the followers in the practicing Muslims in the mosques uh, are Kurdish. Um, but uh, an interesting coincidence, the Mufti of Diyarbakir who represented Recep Tayyip Erdogan two years after uh, resigned from his position and became an HDP MP and now he is still an MP in the parliament. Uh, here we see here we see Nimetullah Erdoğan, the, the, the former Mufti of Diyarbakir, uh, talking to people during, uh, during a protest event where we can see imprisoned HDP leaders, Salatin Demirtas and, and another Kurdish MP, and the former mayor of Diyarbakir is listening. Uh, so Democratic Islam Congress came about in, in 2014 among the <coughs> at the height of the Kurdish conflict. And basically, more than 300 people gathered in this first event in Diyarbakir. Um, and the opening ceremony basically uh, started with a letter sent by Abdullah Öcalan highlighting the importance of uh, democratic and civil and pluralist Islam as a third alternative between the Arab Salafi and Iranian Shia ex extremism. Uh, and obviously there are a lot to say about how Öcalan thinks and reconfigures the situation of religion and political Islam. But definitely um, Abdullah Öcalan proposed that basically the Kurdish national movement is now, uh, he is happy that the Kurdish national movement is a synthesis of a contemporary resi resistance that uh, can be summed up in the, f in, the, in the picture or the image of Saladin in the past, but definitely also there is a coincidence or parallel between Saladin and uh, his connotation to Saladin Demirtas as well. Um, so the Democratic Islam Congress basically <laughs> Uh, highlighted several issues, including the including the importance of the Medina Constitution uh, to form a new state based on a pluralist vision that came uh, at the time of Muhammad when he migrated from Mecca to Medina and established, established an agreement between, uh, uh, between Muhajir who, who migrated uh, with him and, uh, and uh, Aus and Hazresh tribe of, of, uh, of Arabs and also Benu Kainuka and several other Jewish tribes. And uh, I mean, we can talk about this aspect of Medina constitution and what it is in the question session, but basically uh, the Kurdish national movement and the representatives or the participants of this event uh, uh, found it quite important to have an, a constitutional base, an agreement, and they also argued that uh, the true Islam uh, is providing a ground, a platform for all these Islamic nations to come together and agree on certain issues. And uh, the proposition that came from the Kurdish movement was the pluralist vision that was also implemented across uh, different fields of society in, in, in gender studies, in, 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 in cultural studies, or in the municipalities, and all these bottom-up organizations. So uh, this also has expanded to, uh, to, to Rojava, to Syria, Syria, where we see Democratic Islam Congress has gathered in uh, in Ahmadiyya for a while uh, in in 2016 again, and. Uh also, Democratic Islam Congress, the second Democratic Islam Congress that took place in, in Istanbul in 2016, uh, started with, uh, with uh, a hunger strike called Direniş uh, Orucu in Turkish, the resistance fasting. Uh, so members of Democratic Islam Congress basically uh, hunger striked against the ongoing conflict across the Kurdish region. Uh, and uh, also they highlighted the importance and the necessity of uh, basically uh, benefiting from religious prayers as a form of resistance and civil disobedience. Um, 
So, in in general, uh, the Kurdish national movement basically uh, in the 1990s became. Uh, gained a big social base, and uh, they they had to confront with the religious aspect of the Kurdish society. So in the 1990s, there was a hesitant change. The ground, the the the, the field was quite uh, religious. The supporting base was religious, but the ruling elites of of the illegal or illegal uh, party was still uh, strict Marxist. But then, with the paradigm change, basically as a part of this expansion and 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 uh, the notion of peoples of Turkey. The Muslim communities, uh, the religious or conservative uh, Kurds, have been considered as, or have been framed as another nation who need to be included in the party politics. So we see the religious Kurdish MPs or Kurdish religious Kurdish scholars like Kadri Yildirim or Ayhan Bilgen uh, doing the legal politics. We see uh, figures and sheikhs and mullahs in the Kurdish TVs talking about these aspects and talking about the true notion of Islam and so on and so on. Um, in short, basically, we see how religious discourses have been adopted uh, by the Kurdish national movement to expand their base and gain more support, both in the legal and uh, the legal level. Um, the second part of my talk will be focusing on the Kurdish Hezbollah. I intentionally put it on the second part, so because there is a lot to talk about the Kurdish Hezbollah, at least is main, my main area of, of study. But um, in parallel with the development of the Kurdish national movement and the situation of Islam within the movement, we need to also consider the the, the incomplete reconfiguration of the Kurdish Hezbollah, who uh, or that was established in 1979 and maintained uh, quite um, blurred boundaries with the Kurdish political identity uh, throughout 1980s when they were supported by the Iran Islamic Revolution and inspired by the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, obviously some other scholars like Saidi Nursi and, and so on and so on. <laughs> so the situation, I mean, in the earlier stage when the Kurdish Hezbollah was just an illegal organization uh, conducting a lot of murders and uh, targeting the Kurdish activists and uh, pro-PKK figures as well as the critical uh, Islamic figures, we, when we think about this, uh, their connection to the Kurdish political identity, we see that they are quite hesitant and uh, they have an ambiguous relationship with the Kurdish uh, political uh, situations. Although they, uh, they, they speak more Kurdish than perhaps the, the legal representatives of the, the uh, Kurdish political parties, they live more traditional lives. Uh, they, their way of being is, let's say, uh, authentically speaking, is more Kurdish, but also they want to basically kind of like freeze that way of being and provide, like, instead of like basically uh, understanding what society is, is transforming into, but uh, more like basically to, keeping, to, to keep them uh, in a certain perspective. Um, and obviously through 1980s and 1990s we see the influence of the state uh, in the Kurdish in the Hezbollah administration. So at the beginning Hezbollah uh, aimed to establish the Sharia based government in Turkey uh, and the state in their discourse was Tarut, a tyrannical state that should not be obeyed and any, any official uh, conduct within the nation state is considered Considered as haram and, and should be avoided. Uh, but, however, we also see a, a configuration, a reconfiguration of this perception uh, through several events and, 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 uh, and incidents. And obviously, uh, Hezbollah's quest for power and also legitimacy among the Kurdish society, considering that the Kurdish Hezbollah is responsible for murdered, uh, mur the murder of 700 Kurdish people uh, in the 1990s, is one of the main motivation behind this transformation that I, I, uh, I argue that it is still incomplete. Um, as I said, Hezbollah in the 1990s uh, kept blurred boundaries with the Kurdish identity and they maintained more pan-Islamist goals. So, um, 
In terms of the, their ideology, basically the Hezbollah administration uh, was previously involved uh, in some collaborative work with, uh, with the Turkish Islamist movements like uh, Milliturk Talebe Birli and uh, some other groups that also the Justice and Development Party uh, came from. Uh, and uh, the perception of the Turkish Islamism has always been an, uh, an uneven uh, towards the Kurdish situation. So where the, you can see a lot of activism among the Turkish Islamists about Palestine, about Myanmar, uh, about Egypt and other places, you cannot really equally uh, see a similar concern or interest in what uh, has been going on in the Kurdish political uh, field. And obviously Hezbollah wanted to also avoid the heavy price of the Kurdish uh, political identity in 1990s when there was a lot of state criminality going on. And uh, from early 1990s, basically, there was a rivalry and hostility between these two groups. And uh, while one of them was maintaining a nationalist line, speaking on behalf of uh, the nation of the Kurdistan, uh, the other group has preferred to speak for the nation of Islam, for the Ummet. Um, so in the 2000s, we see several failed Kurdish openings that also transformed the Kurdish Hezbollah. And it began in 2000s with the security operations in a house compound, compound in Istanbul, Beykoz, where the Hezbollah leader and founder Hussein Veliol was killed and the Hezbollah archive uh, consisting of uh, 100,000 pages and biographies and information uh, seized by the security forces. This led to other operations across Turkey where they found buried people in the houses and uh, and uh, for those who are familiar basically the whole conflict of the 1990s we had a glimpse of it. Um, and uh, after this basically Hezbollah went underground for a few years uh, where more than 20,000 of their members either detained or arrested and their capacity to operate underground basically has been affected by these security operations a lot. And also the Hezbollah members were not really eager to operate in underground activities because of their fear uh, uh, of the state and the, the operations. So what happened in the early 2000s basically is uh, related to some uh, national and international developments. One of them was basically the Justice and Development Party coming, to, uh, uh, coming into power and increasingly controlling the whole state resources. And also Turkey's uh, European Union member membership has uh, led to a new process where, where uh, <laughs> To be exact, 4.5 billion euros have been transferred to Turkish institutions to support the civil society uh, in Turkey. But most of these funds through state and state agencies have been basically dedicated to these Islamic groups, not only Hezbollah, but also uh, some other groups on the regional and the national level, like Ansar Foundation or Ilimi Ayma Cemiyeti, or uh, obviously Gülenist before, uh, before 2013. And uh, some smaller scale uh, Kurdish Islamist groups. And the state motivation basically was to support the Islamic NGOs and civil society organizations in the region uh, as a counter strategy to deal with the Kurdish, the raising Kurdish um, and, uh, the, the, the aspirations. So uh, obviously the state has uh, supported these organizations while suppressed many others eventually, especially after 2016. And in, two <coughs> in 2004, uh, Hezbollah members initiated their first uh, civil society organizations, the Association uh, for the Oppressed, Mustazaflar uh, Derni, uh, and uh, they started to organize uh, uh, basically charity events and uh, they supported around 3,000 families when they began uh, their humanitarian aid, uh, mostly displaced people or those Hezbollah members uh, or the family families of Hezbollah members who are 
are in prison and so on and so on. And um, in 2006, basically, the cartoon controversy in Denmark, when, when it, it uh, broke out, uh, Hezbollah organized uh, a big uh, rally, a protest in, in Diyarbakir, where almost a million of people attended. And this inco encouraged uh, the Kurdish Hezbollah to basically expand their legal activities. So they started to organize several other events and uh, initiate um, many other civil society organizations, which eventually turned into like thousands of civil society organizations, uh, difficult to track, uh, charities, international NGOs. TV channels, newspapers, magazines, uh, student housings, dormitories, income generating businesses, and so on and so on. Um, and obviously, in this process, uh, Hudapar. Uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the Mustazaflar Association was the leading, leading figure of this civil societization of the Islamist politics in the Kurdish area. Um, Mustazaflar Association was uh, shut down by, by the Supreme Court in 2012, which uh, basically resulted in the establishment of the first political party, uh, Hurdawa Party, or the Free Cause Party, or uh, Considering it in Kurdish, Khudapar means the party of God, and uh, it is similar to Hezbollah. So Hezbollah is the party of God in Arabic, and Khudapar is the party of God in Kurdish. So I think this kind of explains uh, what the transformation of Hezbollah was at this stage. Uh, so in 2012, we see that Khudapar basically has been established uh, as a political party, and it provided them more space where, I mean, some of my informants told me that it was quite difficult to talk to a state representative when we were just a civil society organization, but now we have legal representation in the highest level when we have a political party. Um, so we s the, be the usage of the public space by both parties is quite extensive and important. So one of them is the Kutludom, the blessed bird, and how basically it turned into a week of celebration where we see the graduate ceremonies of the Kurdish uh, women madrasas, where the uh, women Hezbollah members graduate. Or we see Siyer Yarışmalar, uh, like competition to recite and memorize the life of uh, Muhammad and his friends, and the winners are sent to Mecca for Umrah. And uh, also we see that the Kutludom becomes a platform for recruitment and mobilization purposes where people like basically participate in big excitements. Participants of this organization uh, come from all these Kurdish conservative backgrounds and they are not necessarily pro Hezbollah, but definitely they, it is the space where basically they have the contact with, with uh, the Hezbollah and uh, the, the legal Hezbollah activities. Um, on, uh, on another perspective, also the, um, the, the, the perception or the, the frame of the Kurdish question in the Hudapar party program uh, needs to be scrutinized. Uh, when we check the Hudapar party program, we see that like, basically there is a separate section on the Kurdish question, and obviously when uh, they talk about the Kurdish question, they, uh, they share some similarities with the Islamist, uh, the national Islamist discourse. Uh, so for example, they put a lot of blame on the early Republican period, the, the modernizing uh, uh, projects of the state during the, um, during the CHP period, and so on and so on. And then uh, it diverts from, uh, from the Islamist, the national Islamist perspective when it talks about the Kurdish issue. So although it says that the result is uh, the abolishment of the Khalifa and the punishment of Sheikh Said and, 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 and these historical figures, uh, then they start to propose what is essential to solve the Kurdish p uh, question. And, and if you cover the upper part, uh, basically you see that the similar demands and requests by both HDP and Hudapar uh, highlighting some, some issues. I mean, um, a similar ground, I would say. And one of them is definitely the constitutional recognition of the Kurds, which uh, uh, stated uh, both by Hudapar and HDP.
and also the Kurdish uh, language and collective rights in, in many levels are the concerns and the demands of the both parties. And uh, also, the truth committees to investigate what has happened in the 1990s and the official apologies to uh, historical figures like Sheikh Said and his friends are uh, the details that we can find in the Hudapar Party program. Uh, however, this uh, uh, these details and demands in the party program cannot be found equally in the public discourse of the political leaders of uh, the Hezbollah. Uh, I have attended several events including Kutludom and party meetings and rallies and protests and, and, and smaller scales uh, conferences and events in, in the cities of uh, Bingöl, Diyarbakir, Mardin, Batman, so in, in Southeast Turkey. And uh, it is definitely like when they talk about when they talk about the, their perspective, they maintain an Islamist or pan-Islamist line more than like basically uh, putting any emphasis on, on the Kurdish question. And obviously they, for example, begin with uh, Quranic recitation at the beginning of their event and then they speak uh, in Kurmanji and they speak in Zazaki, uh, like depends on the context. So for example, in, in that event in, uh, in Bingöl, in North of Diyarbakir, one site uh, where I attended uh, uh, a political uh, uh, Hudapar's uh, political meeting before uh, before June 2015 elections. Um, the uh, Hudapar leader Zekeriya Yapujolu, for example, talked about Sheikh Said, and uh, he said that you know we are basically we are inspired by Sheikh Said. We we continue the dawah, the cause of Sheikh Said, and so on and so on. Um, but then, uh, short after, basically the whole discourse developed into like this you know big Islamic nation and un anti-West uh, conspiracy theories that that. Uh, Israel and, and United <laughs> Kingdom and the United States are manipulating the Kurdistan through the PKK and so on and so on. So after a short while, basically, the whole uh, talk was dedicated to uh, um, a PKK critics. But <clears throat> Also, we need to highlight that right after the failure of the, the, the Kurdish peace negotiation between the PKK and the state in, in 2016, uh, Hezbollah-related civil society organizations organized uh, a big conference in Diyarbakir uh, in, uh, in, early, in early 2015. And uh, the title of the conference was Islamic Solution to the Kurdish Question. And uh, here there was there was um, there was um, representatives of 3,500 Islamic NGOs from the region, uh, 600 people, uh, about 200 uh, Saydas and Melas, and representatives of uh, trade unions, pro-government trade unions, and so on and so on, have participated in this event, two-day event. I was there also as, as an observer. And the whole idea was basically uh, providing a supporting base saying that Islam is the only solution to the Kurdish question and the state has failed, uh, has, has, has mistaken to negotiate the Kurdish peace process with the PKK and now people are basically suffering as a result of this, uh, uh, this um, wrong decision. So if they want to really resolve uh, the Kurdish question, they need to negotiate uh, with the real representatives of the Kurdish people who represent the real values of Kurdish nation and who are sensitive to their uh, religions and, and, and so on and so on. So, um, and obviously the reconfigur reconfiguration of historical figures which we cannot find in, in the tradition of illegal Hezbollah in the 1980s and 90s is quite present after 2000s. So in the 1980s and 90s Hezbollah for example produced many albums or cassettes uh, of the caravan of martyrs, Shehitler Kervanu and Mezgin and Shehid and, and, and all this. And the whole discourse is about the martyrdom and about the Shahadet and uh, like basically giving your life 
die for the cause and so on and so on and especially like those uh, those songs and lyrics written for for uh, Hezbollah members who lost their life in conflict with the PKK or the state and we don't see any reference to, for example, to the the leader of the Sheikh Said rebellion. Uh, I mean, the the, the rebellion. Uh, we don't see any reference to Sheikh Said. We don't see any reference to other sheikhs. We even don't see references to some Islamist figures like Said Hawa, who influenced the Kurdish Hezbollah's uh, political theology, uh, and who was based in Syria, a Kurdish background. And no one really tells that Said Hawa himself was Kurdish. But then in the 2000s we see that like basically Hezbollah bringing all these uh, these figures and uh, creating for example like protest prayers in uh, in front of the uh, in front of the Grand Mosque of the Arbakr uh, in 2014 or, or organizing a conference on the name of Sheikh Said and uh, so on and so on. So <coughs> I think, uh, as a result, we can say that both <coughs> movements, and this is not an equal movement, one of them has like at least 10 million base and the other perhaps is two, three hundred thousand people at most, uh, but both separately agree on certain issues regarding to the Kurdish collective rights and language rights, and they demand the same issues, but because of the hostility and rivalry between them, it is quite difficult to really to come at term uh, and uh, create a consensus or an alliance between these groups. Uh, for example, recently nine Kurdish political parties created a Kurdish language platform where Hezbollah was not invited. Um, so developments like this make us think whether there will be any further divide or possible consensus. And I think uh, some small details in the process of many elections in Turkey in 2015 and 16, and before that during the Kobani protest, we have seen that uh, further divide is more likely, uh, considering that, for example, during the Kobani protest, several uh, Hezbollah members or members of uh, civil society organizations affiliated to Hezbollah uh, was brutally murdered and in response Hezbollah's armed unit Sheikh Said Siriyeleri and Hussein Fedaileri, the brigades of Sheikh Said and the bodyguards of Hussein in the Arbakr and Batman uh, went out on the streets uh, with their rifles and Kalashnikovs and they killed several Kurdish uh, activists and pro-PKK people right after the the, uh, the murder of Aytaj Baran in, in 2000 um, so, um, in that regard, I think the reconfiguration of, uh, of both groups is uh, still ongoing and the, the, the situation or the position of the state and how state basically manipulates and, and, and supports one group while suppress the other is quite important to, to, to understand the direction of the situation. But on the regional level also now there are no developments where we see basically uh, different form of forms of uh, extremism competing in the Syrian field where also the Kurdish national movement is arguing a third possible way uh, based on democratic and pluralist options. Um, we will basically in the future see how these situations are going to develop and I am happy to reply to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Beautiful paper. Yeah. Very well constructed. Very clear. Um, <clears throat> a huge amount of fascinating detail uh, and uh, very sharp analysis. I think we have plenty of food for thought for comments, questions and discussion. Uh, so without further ado, we will move to those. Um, Yes, thank you. Please raise your hand. And when you speak, please also introduce yourself. That would be very helpful. We'll start here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm Nadel Ali Kudisawa. So, I mean, um, really what your work does, it really challenges the very simplistic narrative about the Kurdish political movement being secular. And, I mean, uh, for me, it was the first time when I heard your previous work that to know about Kurdish Hezbollah. But today, 
you complicated the picture even further and spoke about the way that the PKK-led movement, both the armed one and the political one, also has to take on board Islam or people's attitudes to Islam. And clearly, that is changing in the context of the rise of political Islam, as you show, but at the same time, also the AKP's instrumentalization of Islam. So I'd like you to sort of I'd like to push you on two things. One is, you know, this kind of tension between, like, especially the last decade when the AKP has been really pursuing Islamist politics, and whether you have a sort of shift in terms of Turkey on the one side, and then on the other hand, you have political Islam playing a more dominant role. So how is the, I guess, PKK kind of maneuvering this tension? And then, not surprisingly, coming from me, I mean, how is all this gendered? I mean, you're speaking about, you know, Hezbollah presenting the true kind of, they're thinking of themselves as a more authentic, traditional Kurds. Clearly, that has gendered implications, particularly in the context where gender-based justice and equality is so central for the PKK-led movement. So how is this playing out, and how is, again, the PKK maneuvering, negotiating gender in the context of this tension. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. Those are quite chunky questions. Do so you want to take those two and then we'll round up a yeah. few more start yeah, with those? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's open noise. Right? Yeah, thank you, you can hear me. Thank you, Nadia. Um, well, I was hoping to clarify some situation, but I think I made it more complicated in terms of like all these situations. I'm trying to make a sense of it, basically, because these processes are ongoing, and uh, we cannot really put an end or like say that like this is how it is going to be in the next 10 or 20 years. But we can see some directions, and obviously the PKK or the Kurdish National Movement uh, uh, during the AKP period uh, had several challenges and one of them is like the the usage of the political Islam or the, the, the discourse of brotherhood and Islamic unity and the the, the religious and uh, local values and so on and so on so this equally I think has affected the Kurdish national movement in multiple levels uh, which I try to basically briefly outline um, so one of them is obviously uh, uh, creating a counter argument that what you represent or what you say is not Islamic but what we do is Islamic and in that tension uh, the mainstream Islamist movements basically maintain like you know the, the, the classic uh, Islamist uh, discourses while we see the PKK uh, is more ambitious in terms of like basically forming uh, a more pluralist or, democ or democratic uh, Islam. If you look at the letter of Abdullah Hujalan sent to Democratic Islam Congress, for example, in 2014, he clearly demands that uh, demands from the participants of the Congress that it is your duty to provide uh, the legitimate, legitimate ground or to provide the details and argumentations based on uh, the readings of the historical texts or the Quran, and to say uh, that that. Uh, uh, a democratic or civil or pluralist Islam is more compatible to uh, the model of the Kurdish uh, national movement, which he is proud that he represents the Salah al-Din, so another figure uh, from history. Um, but at the same time, obviously, uh, there is also like a secularist uh, uh, leading cadre in the Kurdish politics, uh, and they are frequently criticized by the Kurdish conservatives who vote for HDP. Um, and this tens tension is still ongoing, so there is an, an end for this tension. Like in many cases, for example, during the Civil Friday prayers, we see that uh, not Salahatin Demirtas or Osman Baydemir or several other MPs, but some representatives of the Kurdish party or the local administration have been in 
the area of Civil Friday prayers, and uh, they didn't participate in prayer, which this was picked up by the mainstream Turkish media, the pro AKP media, saying that like basically, see, these people are abusing religion, they don't pray, but like basically, like manipulating this and that. So this tension, I think, is uh, is, is quite complicated situation, and definitely it has uh, it has affected how the Kurdish leadership, Abdullah Hujalan, has uh, has framed his arguments uh, and how he constructed his discourses around this uh, situation. So, like you can see that, like you know, many references to the the Muslim fraternity and the true notion of Islam is exactly compatible to the model uh, um, model uh, proposed by by uh, the Kurdish leadership and so on and so on. Um, in terms of the gender issue, I think it is one of the most disputed areas between the PKK and Hezbollah. Um, so on one hand, as you said, uh, the, the Kurdish women movement is quite strong and it is kind of a prominent uh, uh, aspect of a child of, of, of the Kurdish movement, we, as we see, like both on the battleground, uh, but also in the institutions, administration, and the core leadership model from like all levels. Although the implementation of this is kind of uh, prevented by the state in the last two or three years. Uh, while we see quite uh, traditional uh, patriarchal models in the Hezbollah discourse, but both sides do not really hesitate to have women branches. And even in Hezbollah events, actually, the women section are more prominent. <laughs> So um, maybe I can, I can just like provide an example how the, the situation is on the ground based on my observation uh, from 2016 Kurdish New Year celebration in Diyarbakir Nevroz Park and uh, a month after the celebration of Mohammed's birthday in April 2016. So I participated in both events and the main difference is the Kurdish national movement uh, has an open space where women and men are do not not have to basically go to separate sections. Uh, and it is more colorful and you see basically women agency more prominent than the others. Whereas you see the same excitement uh, and uh, even I would say like more frantical support uh, from the female Hezbollah members who are like basically surrounded by these wires uh, on a corner um, and uh, and uh, like several times I was filming for a documentary film so several times I tried to go to that that uh, area and I was prevented I've been told that like that is the woman section no one is allowed in um, but I have made I, I've uh, made interviews with the uh, the women members of uh, Hezbollah NGOs and uh, obviously uh, their activities through these uh, uh, through these NGOs and the the events uh, organized by these NGOs provide a space for these people, uh, so they can go out based on like you know kind of like have a legitimate. Uh, answer to their parents or husbands or brothers so they can like go and like you know do their activism uh, on the ground without any hesitation to like kind of you know being kept in in, uh, in the door but I don't think that, that this is like kind of a progressive development in terms of Hezbollah's uh, approach to women issues and they frequently criticize the Kurdish movement that they gave basically bumped the ground of, of uh, the the traditional uh, values that we have between, and like many informants for example is said that like you know now if women and men can dance together in the Kurdish weddings this is the the, the result of the PKK's manipulation so yeah thank you very much cool. let's take a few more gentlemen here and then there's a gentleman there and then you as well please um, I found your lecture very interesting. So, so would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, my name is Muzammil Ha. Um, so, this is very interesting, but it raised so many questions in my mind. First of all, you are talking about the Kurdish movement. 
this could this movement in Turkey in relation with Turkey. And I think you know the uh, Kurdish community are not in one place. It was in one place during the Salahuddin's time. And who had created these three divisions? When it was created these three divisions into three countries, the Turkey, Iran, and the Syria. And when this PKK movement, or the movement called this movement within Turkey was started, who were their leaders? And how, who, how they were inspired? to have a Kurdish movement in Turkey only, not only that which was divided, uh, and how it, it was divided into three countries. And the other things are, which is, uh, I do not understand its relationship with Islam and ethnicity. Your title is Islam and ethnicity. Where comes this Islam and ethnicity in this movement, in Kurdish movement? Of course, if you go back to the Salahuddin style or during the Ottoman period, that is completely different. But after the Second World, First World War, it is a completely different picture. Thank you. That's, so that's I want point. to know these three. Thank you. Two clear points. Those will be questions. We have a gentleman further back. Thank you, guest, please. Cool. Yes. Thank you, Rian, for the talk. My name is Bang, and I'm a student here at LLC. I have a similar question. I want to ask you exactly. I mean, you told us the Kurdish war was founded in 1997. So I want to ask you exactly what was the funding momentum, what was the reason why it was founded, and specifically the link between Islam and the Kurdish movement, where is this coming from? Yeah. Also, the second question, how is it embedded into this regional all issues of Islam? I mean, which kind of other actors did contribute to the flourishing of this kind of movement, specifically regarding, you mentioned also the the Turkish Islamist movement, as well as, I mean, there are other religious actors also in the region. There is like also the Saudi Arabian faction, of course, the Modern Brotherhood. So I would like to hear this kind of how it is embedded. In a short final question, I would like to hear some figures. I mean, about how many people are we talking about? What percentage, specifically in <laughs> Turkey, but also maybe in other regions, like in other countries? Figures of. Uh, Kurds or Hezbollah? Or? No, of course it's people, not uh, just the Kurdish Hezbollah. Okay. Supporters of Kurdish Hezbollah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We did cover that. We'll come back to it. Yes, please. Um, I, hi, I'm Zeynep Kaya from the LC um, Living Center. I have a bit of a general broad question uh, situating the use of political Islam as a framework of legitimacy for political activism. Um, by Kurdish, uh, by Kurdish organizations, by Kurdish political actors, and we know that as you refer to the early 20th century, the JSI, and Sheikh Abraham Lark, there was an Islamic reference, very clear Islamic reference then. So, it, it, as, as someone working on um, the use of religion by nationalist organization or by by a nationalist movement, um, and the intersection of nationalism and religion. How much do you think it's different now, but because of Hezbollah and the early 20th century, the inter that intersection between religion and nationalism? Obviously, there are there are two different historical processes. Do you see any continuities? And the second related question is, how much do you think the um, in the Turkish case, at least, being a secular? country establishes a secular, secular, secular public and state in the, 20, in the 1920s, and then the whole socio-economic transformation, uh, the socio-economic changes that affected the Kurdish political movement. The Kurdish political movement in Turkey is much more diverse than, I think, other, other parts of Turkey, mainly because of the numbers, but also because of the socio-economic structure in, in Turkey and the engagement with the leftist organizations in the 1980s, PKK secularism, Marxism, do you think this has had an impact on the way? So we are looking at it from from uh, the from the Hezbollah perspective. How is Hezbollah and Kurdish political actors using religion as a platform of legitimacy mm -hmm. are navigating this space created by the secular <coughs> context within Turkey and also created by the PKK? Yeah. Um, mm. That's very clear, thank you. There's a fair bit of overlap there. So <coughs> yeah, yeah, grouping yeah. those three. So I think I will group these three. I mean, in terms of figures, um, 
we cannot give an exact number how many people are supporting Hezbollah in, in the Kurdish Turkey. We can give some informed guesses uh, based on the previous elections and also like kind of uh, some analysis based on based on uh, the events they organize, the numbers of participants they attend, although they are not necessarily Hezbollah members. And uh, my informed guess, which I say in my book, is 200, 300,000 people. Um, but this does not really include the recent developments in, uh, in, in the last two, three years. And uh, I would say that the majority of these people are Kurdish-speaking people, whereas we can also find some Arabic-speaking people in several cities like Mardin, Sirt, or Batman, but their numbers are limited. And with the legal activities, basically, previously they were like they had big or powerful strongholds uh, across the Kurdish region, like in the town of Nusaybin or Batman or Silvan or some neighborhoods of the Arbakr. But with the legal activities, now we see that like basically Hudapar, the political party, is established all across Turkey. Their NGOs uh, are not only in the Kurdish region, but also they have representations and, and civil society organizations um, in central Turkish cities across like the the coastal cities where the Kurdish people reside. So in this, they are quite strong and powerful in Adana and Mersin and Izmir and Antalya and, and Istanbul and so on. Um, so I'm in the situation of religion and ethnicity in the Kurdish movements in general. I mean, considering the 20 developments in, in the um, 19th century and 20th century, uh, I think most of the Kurdish resistance movements uh, had a religious aspects or led by religious figures uh, in the past. So when, uh, I mean, some of them obviously like, you know, like Bedr Khanis are coming from like the, the, uh, the, the traditional landlord system. Uh, in the region, but most of them are affiliated to some Sufi Naqshbandi, some of them are Qadri sheikhs or some Alevi sheikhs in the past. And uh, Kemal Suleimani actually has written a book about this, and uh, he argues that uh, through, like, basically these rebellions and resistance uh, in 19th century and 20th century, especially more, specific, more specifically uh, through uh, the Sheikh Ubaidullah uh, Nehri uh, uprising and Sheikh Said rebellion in uh, in 19 and early 20th century, we can see a form of religious nationalism among these leaders. How they argue the Kurdish cause and how they basically uh, legitimize the situation. That like on one hand. Uh, they declare their loyalty to Islam, but on the other, they also highlight the necessity of a separate administration and so on. And uh, obviously, this has continued till 1950s, though we can talk about like a silent, silent period, especially after 1938. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, with the multi-party system in the Turkish political sphere, the strict secularist uh, polity has changed, and uh, basically. The, the, uh, the Democrat Party uh, has reached to Kurdish nobles, Kurdish sheikhs and Avas, and like basically brought them into the legal politics to receive more votes. So like in that case, basically we see kind of a colonial administration dealing with the colonial subjects through some representatives of Avas and sheikhs. And uh, so uh, from 1950s to basically 1970s, we see a situation where religious elites support the state and represent the state and they benefit from the state support in the area, which basically created a point of resistance among a later generations of Kurdish youth who basically studied in Western Turkish cities and got the influence of Marxism and socialism and so on and so on. Though it is not necessarily anti-religion, I mean it was always there. So there is a discourse like as if like you know PKK invented religion or found religion in 1990s. But even before that, I mean. Uh, 
Dr. Shivan, for example, in the ninth, like in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, and, and he was a revolutionary figure, uh, the the leader of the Turkey uh, um, KDP, and. Uh, like just within a year from 1969, for example, Dr. Shivan uh, recruited more than 5,000 people around Hakkari region. And he was a Marxist from Dersim, from Alevi background. But he was basically, whenever he went to like these village houses to recruit people and do his propaganda, he went with an imam, with a seda. And the seda basically recite Quran first and like talked about religion and so on and so on. And then he started to do his. Uh, his, his propaganda to recruit supporters. Um, so I would say that actually the early period of the PKK was almost an exemption where we see uh, more emphasis on, on uh, ethnicity and kind of an ignorance of religion uh, for, for a period of time. But then it was contradictory to the reality on the ground where especially before the forced displacement in the 1990s, Kurdish society was quite practicing and conservative in, in, in many sense, living in countryside. Um, but this gradually has changed, uh, though in terms of their connection to the past, I mean, it is fluctuating and uneven process. And it needs to basically, it needs to be articulated based on the particularity of that period, who is saying it and why is saying it and uh, for what purpose. So for example, when we look at what Abdullah Hujalan says about Sheikh Said, it quite varies like from like, you know, being a tool at the hand of the British Empire. On the other hand, like we see that Abdullah Hujalan, like almost within a few years, tells that like he was the leader, like an anti anti colonial colonial leader who resisted against this and that. And uh, or like on the other hand, like Abdullah Hujalan's reference to Salahuddin or Medina Constitution and or this and that is strongly related to uh, creating a medium to negotiate with the state as a prisoned uh, person. So, uh, but I think there are like here two issues that needs to be tackled. And one of them is like the usage of the, uh, the, the, the Islamic discourses in the political sphere or by the political actors and the situation of practicing Muslims and the situation of like, you know, religion on the ground. Um, Hezbollah definitely thinks and argues that they represent the cause of Sheikh Said, uh, and they increasingly say that. So now they have many songs, for example, about Sheikh Said in Kurdish. Um, they basically uh, they started to commemorate the Sheikh Said's uh, uh, murder or execution and his friend's ex ex execution in, in 29th of January in 1926. And uh, they first began to commemorate this in the Grand Mosque of Diyarbakir. But just one year after, basically, the Kurdish movement then changed the name the name of Dalka Square, where Sheikh Said and his friends were hanged, to Sheikh Said Square. So we can say that although their number is quite limited, I think in terms of like you know their agency and the influence they create, they are quite influential. Um, I would say that, like you know, we can talk about like um, a rudimentary form of religious nationalism in Hezbollah discourse, but the situation in the Kurdish national movement is more complicated, because on one hand, I mean, we can talk that these people, I mean, definitely want to benefit from. Uh, uh, from like you know the the area that an Islamic discourse provides and the reach that they can basically uh, make through these discourses. But on the other hand, as you said, there are many uh, components of the Kurdish politics, especially like you know the peoples of Turkey, uh, so all LGBT groups, leftist groups, uh, I mean different ethnic groups, uh, Assyrians, Armenians, and and all these people, and how they can really coexist together is is a question because sometimes you feel like yeah you put all these things together and it looks really good on the discourse but how it is really 
is in, in the practice. I have few observations and experiences um, that tells that it has been successful before the interference of the state. So in Jigarhuin Culture Center in the Arbakur Balar municipality, for example, there was an event, uh, a documentary film festival's event, and at some point, basically, a film was awarded, uh, a documentary film uh, made by a Kurdish LGBT member about the Kurdish LGBTs uh, got an award from the municipality and the person who gave the prize was a Kurdish uh, Seda, an imam. <laughs> and uh, there was also like you know, a peace mother, like a mother who lost her, her daughter or son uh, in the fight, they are called, you know, Barishan Neleri. And uh, so it was quite interesting to see like these people standing on the stage and, and like speaking of the same situation. But... Like at the time of resistance, it is easy to collaborate. But then when you have power, then, then we need to see. Yeah. Thank you. The hands are shooting up now. Um, we haven't got too much time left, so if you wouldn't mind being fairly brief, and likewise our esteemed speaker. Sorry. There was a gentleman further back who had his hand up earlier. Are you still... No? Okay then, so we've got one, two, three, four. You've had one, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. We're running out of time, five. Oh, so let's go. Answer. We'll speak to the speaker at the end afterwards. Yeah. Let's go to you and then you, please. Yes. Hi, Thank uh, you. Um, so since the inception of the movement, has there been any dialogue uh, the from Kurdish Hizbullah to create um, further support in the greater Kurdistan area? and in that sense as well legitimize this idea of the code of sensitivism. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Anthony Graves, and my question is about the Iran relation that you mentioned um, with, uh, on the onset of, or the start of um, uh, uh, Turkish Hezbollah in 1979 throughout the 1980s. And can you say a little bit about the extent and nature of mm. the political religious relationship between Iran and the, um, Turkish Hezbollah today as well as mm -hmm. at the time? Lovely. Nice neat question. Yes, please, in front. Thank, thank you very much, my name is Shivani. Just a very quick one. Uh, how do you think the, the perception of the claim that maybe Turkey has been complacent in preventing uh, ISIS, or especially in the bottom of Kobane, where it wasn't easy for people to cross the border to help basically defend uh, the city, how does that change the perception among the Kurdish uh, populace towards mm -hmm. uh, Hudapar and this uh, Islamic nationalism that you were talking about? Lovely. Yeah. Thank you very precise as well, David. David McDowell, and um, my question has really been asked, but it's one sees that actually what goes on within one part of Kurdistan influences people in another, in the secular field. Um, but I'm just wondering how far that's true within the Islamic field. One can see that um, political Islam has had a general effect, but I'm just wondering, does Hezbollah, for example, have a relationship with Islamic movements in Iraqi Kurdistan? Yeah, so nice that. range of subjects. I think we've got one final question from the front here, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Barry. I'm also a student at the LSU. My question is, uh, how does the Hezbollah target assimilated Kurds and Kurds who have migrated to Western Turkey? Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Right, a lovely menu of topics there for you to tackle in conclusion. Yeah. You rattle through those five. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, let's combine the how Hezbollah created a dialogue or, and also like the transnational connections uh, in the Islamic field. Um, I mean, Hezbollah. At the beginning, basically, we're, we're hesitant to, to engage with other Kurdish Islamist groups across borders. So uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, there isn't a great connection or kind of like, you know, meetings between these groups, although 
uh, we can see that like basically they have some uh, some uh, dialogues or, or talks with several uh, Islamic figures like Said Hawa in Syria and also some um, members of Ansar uh, al-Islam uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Osman and uh, Sheikh Ali uh, I forgot their affiliation but Sheikh Osman and Ali uh, who had a military base in Iran supported by Iran for a while and their connection with this group basically took I think uh, through channels with Iran um, but in the later year like if you go to for example a blessed bird festival uh, you see many representatives coming from different countries uh, like members of Islamist parties and groups in Iraq or in Iraqi Kurdistan more particular uh, people from Palestine uh, from Egypt uh, from Iran uh, so you see Qadiris you see some Naqshbandis you see some Islamist groups uh, participating in these events so in that regard I think uh, Hezbollah has not only kind of targeted the legal politics within Turkish borders but also they have at least a plan or ambition to expand further and create some form of collaboration with other Islamist groups though I cannot really provide details to what extent really this dialogue has turned into some form of alliance and so on um, the Iran relation, I mean, Hezbollah was founded uh, very short after the Iran Islamic Revolution. And definitely the Hezbollah leadership in the early age uh, was inspired by this revolutionary Islamic uh, figures and minds. So Imam Khomeini, Ali Shariati, and, and several other scholars and writers were quite influential on Hezbollah circles. Uh, and at the time when Hezbollah didn't have any publication, basically people uh, or the Hezbollah supporters were given these books of Imam Khomeini and Ali Shariati or Sayyid Qutub or Abu Ala al Maududi and so on. Um, so, and uh, but the influence or the, co the the collaboration with Iran was not only through these like revolutionary figures obviously there was also some logistical uh, connection between the two groups because uh, Iran uh, wanted to basically expand its revolutionary influence towards other Islamic uh, countries and they were in in, in uh, connection with uh, several uh, Islamic groups in Turkey including the Hezbollah uh, and their goal or aim was basically to create uh, some form of alliance or unity between these like smaller, bigger Islamist groups across Turkey, uh, and even, if possible, to basically convert them sh to Shia, uh, which uh, didn't work out for sure. And uh, after a while, I mean, the Kurdish Hezbollah kind of were hesitant because of like this suppression coming from Iran. And uh, there was some disputes between like different groups of Hezbollah. Uh, so the Hezbollah we call uh, was a circle around a bookstore called Ilim, the knowledge. But there was another bookstore called Menzil, which was the second branch of Hezbollah eliminated by Hezbollah. And there was a third group separated from these two, establishing another bookstore in Diyarbakir called Wahdat, which was also eliminated by Hezbollah. So, uh, and the reason between the the dispute uh, between the Menzil and Ilim groups of Hezbollah were basically mainly because of the money coming from Iran uh, in uh, mid 1980s. So I have talked to some people, for example, telling about like the details and how Iran abandoned Hezbollah and kind of like you know after triggering all this conflict between the groups, they kind of abandoned them and didn't intervene to to, to say something. Today, I mean, there isn't like really. A connection, as far as I know, between Iran and Hezbollah. Though, uh, in 2012, when like most of the Islamist groups and NGOs uh, kind of had uh, had supported uh, the uh, situation in Syria in favor of the free Syrian army, uh, quote unquote, uh, Hezbollah basically uh, declared that they won't be part of the war between Muslims. Uh, 
uh, and kind of like you know making a clear statement that they don't consider Iran or like you know Assad um, as anti-Islam and hence it is not mashru, it is not legitimate to fight against them. So to this extent we can we can talk about this. Um, and uh, obviously the regional developments, especially the Kobani and like you know the rise of ISIS and and their brutal events and activities and, and assaults in the field has changed the perception of the Islamism among the Kurds a lot, though it is not a very informed perception, I would say. So for many supporters of the Kurdish national movement, everyone with a beard is ISIS and Hezbollah and so on. Well, I mean, like this created a huge issue because like during the Kobani protest, they thought they are targeting the pro-ISIS or al-Nusra uh, reading rooms, uh, associations, so they attacked the pro-Hezbollah uh, NGOs and killed Yasin Beru and his friends, like 16, 17 years old boy, brutally, which also eventually created like further hostility uh, between the two groups. Um, so the perception of, of radical Islam among the Kurds obviously is not very positive, but at the same time, like in this uh, um, conflicted field, basically we see we see that this this is not only about the internal dynamics, but it is also about transborder dynamics and, and, and also the interference of the state to manipulate the fact on the ground. Uh, did I miss any question? I think I missed yours. But Simulated I, Kurds and yeah. relationship with... Israel. Yeah, I, I, uh, I didn't understand what you mean by that. Can you please articulate more? Um, so Kurds have you know, sort of moved to the Western Turkey and sort of become assimilated more into the Turkish culture. And yeah. Yeah. You know, um, are not one with their country. How does the Hezbollah target them with their policies? Yeah, good. Um, I mean... Uh, my field work is basically in the Kurdish region, so I cannot really provide a precise information like how Hezbollah activities take place in Istanbul, for example, or in Izmir, or in other places. I know that they have big support in the cities, especially like, you know, like uh, Hudapar organizes uh, the Kutlu Dom event, the blessed birth event in Istanbul, Kazlı Çeşme Square, which is quite a big square, and hundreds of thousands of people uh, attend these events. And uh, especially in the last 20 years, I mean, for the Kurds who live uh, out of Kurdistan, uh, there is a huge issue of like, you know, like you know, if you are a Kurd in Turkey or like in other countries as well, perhaps you are not in a very privileged position. So many people like basically benefit from this Islamic identity as a line of flight, what Delos say. Uh, and uh, like in, in, in in that regard, Hezbollah kind of benefits from like this kind of hesitations among the Kurdish people who, who like who want to emphasize more their religious uh, identity rather than their ethnic belonging and their politics. Um, but Hezbollah is also like a very kind of like you know uh, well connected and a close group to some extent. So like most of their networks through uh, happen through like for example traditional form of kinship or uh, let's say like you know tribal networks but also like through all these like personal networks and circles that they want to keep um, and then obviously it is translated into like legal events more wider events but this is the core of their activities and usually like kind of you know the trust issue is uh, is playing a major role in terms of their recruitment activities activities and so on um, and uh, lastly, I mean, since they are favored by the state discourse, I mean, Hudapar now, like for example, for the first time right after the, the, the July coup in 2016, Hudapar leader made a talk just a week after the failed coup in Istanbul Taksim Square, which was like, you know, Kurdish Hezbollah has ha having representation in, in the main square of, of, uh, of Istanbul. Uh, but at the same time, like during the months long 
long uh, democracy meetings where people protested against the failed coup. In the most of the Kurdish cities, uh, it was Kurdish Hezbollah members or Hudapar members uh, at the forefront of these demonstrations. The Hezbollah songs were kind of broadcasted from the squares and so on and so on. So I would say that like in the current version, basically it is quite uh, uh, beneficial to Hezbollah to, to expand their activities through legal events and I don't think that they uh, have a lot of difficulty to reach people in Western Turkey as well. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> this has been terrific. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Um, we really must do events like this more often at LSE. If Zinep and I can get our act together, we'll maybe have some more in January. We will have more in January and February, and <clears throat> we look forward to seeing you at those. Do please come back again. Thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon and for your contribution through your terrific questions and comments. But most of all, huge thanks to Mehmet for sharing your huge quantity of, of research and knowledge, that vast reservoir of information you have on this subject, and for tackling such a, a vast range of subjects put to you by the audience with, with such competence and insightfulness. We're very grateful to you. Delighted you are our colleague at LSE. Looking forward to working more closely with you. And thank you again. Good night.